program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice of the University of San Francisco acknowledges our presence on the unceded land of the indigenous Ohlone communities and pays our respects to these traditional caretakers and elders, past, present, and emerging. It is our intention that this acknowledgement plays a role, however infinitesimal, in a much larger process of confronting the past in order to create a not yet realized future rooted in justice. Welcome everyone to the first event of the USF SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice for this, for the, for this semester, where tonight we are excited to celebrate the release of the new book, This Is Your Song Too, Fish and Contemporary Jewish Identity. My name is Rabbi Camille Angel, and I'm the rabbi in residence at the University of San Francisco. I want to begin thanking the SWIG JSSJ faculty and staff for their help in organizing this event, and particularly Victoria Farlow, without whom this would not be possible. I'd like to take a brief moment to tell you about our SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice. Founded in 1977, our program is the first Jewish Studies chair or program at a Catholic university in the world. In 2008, we were reestablished as the SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice, the first academic program worldwide to formally link Jewish Studies and Social Justice, including a minor in the field. In the classroom, the program offers a wide range of significant Jewish studies courses not found in other educational settings. Beyond the classroom, we offer extraordinary events that are free and open to the public, such as tonight's event. Additionally, JSSJ is excited to announce the first ever graduate level certificate in JEDI, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. This unique program gives professionals the opportunity to learn from both scholars and activists, offering a blend of academic study and real world application. Your education does not need to stop here after you graduate from USF. So whether you want to expand your knowledge for personal development or bring invaluable Jedi skills to your resume, this program will give you all the necessary tools and resources to bring to organizations. Something unique about this program is that it's founded and run by USF and JSSJ alumni. Uh. Let me tell you about one other event uh, we're having this semester, Israelism Film Screening on Monday, November 27th, at uh, 6.30 up in the Handlery Room at Lone Mountain. This film focuses on two young American Jews raised to defend the state of Israel at all costs, one of whom joins the Israeli military while the other fights for Israel on the other battlefield, Americans, America's college campuses. Yet a chasm emerges in their Jewish identities after witnessing Israel's mistreatment of the Palestinian people firsthand. Overall, their stories reveal the American Jewish community's generational divide regarding what the Jewish state means to Jewish Americans. The film screening will be followed by a moderated discussion led by a member of our JSSJ faculty. This event is co-sponsored by the Program in Middle Eastern Studies and the Department of Politics. Tonight, we are excited to celebrate the publication of the new book, This Is Your Song Too, Fish and Contemporary Jewish Identity. We'll hear from three people. We'll hear from three people who contributed to this volume. Dr. Orrin Kroll Zeldin, Interim Director of the JSSJ Program, an Assistant Professor in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, is one of the co-editors of this book. Dr. Ariella Worden Greenfield also co edited the volume. She's the Associate Director of the Feinstein Center for American Jewish History and Special Advisor on Anti Semitism at Temple University. We're also joined by Rabbi Dr. Joshua Layden, who contributed a chapter to the book. He's the Director of Education for the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. 
please join me in welcoming them to the University of San Francisco. Thank you. Um, I want to start by noting that uh, this book is all about joyful ways of being Jewish and joyful ways of connecting to friends, to Jewish community, and to a band community. Right now, we are all in need of joy, I think. We are all at least in need of joy, and so um, this event tonight and this book and this band is all about uh, joyful Jewishness. So I want us to hold on to that as we go through the evening. I also want to note that this book is so many years in the making. It's maybe five years of work, but for all of us who worked on it and contributed to it, it is basically a lifetime of both being Jewish and loving the band Fish. So that's sort of what, what is, I think, an important backstory. I also want to say that um, you, most of you here are undergraduate students here at the University of San Francisco. This is a project that in one way can be traced back to the undergraduate religious studies classes at Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, New York, where Ariella and I were classmates. And we studied together, and then we would bump into each other at fish concerts. And from that sprung, in part, this book. We want to begin by reading some passages from the book to do two things. One, describe what a fish concert is like and what the fish scene is like. You started, I guess, maybe as you were walking in to get a sense of, of that, but want to uh, describe a little bit. And then talk about Jewish identity and fish in the way that we've written about it, and then we'll elaborate uh, for the rest of the evening. Though listening to a recording or reading about the band can provide a window into the world of fish, the best way to fully understand the fish phenomenon is through the live fish experience. A fish show is more than a concert. It is a performative spectacle, one that invites attendees to become participants. Fish shows provide an opportunity not only to see and hear a talented rock band play exceptional music, but also to immerse oneself in a carnivalesque atmosphere that eschews the normalcy of everyday life. Some fans dress in elaborate costumes, and some paint their faces. Others wear their most sparkly attire. Some sport dreadlocks and patchwork clothing, though admittedly less frequently today than in the 1990s when the band experienced a stratospheric rise to fame. Instead of strapping on high heels or loafers, fans don their favorite kicks for a night of dancing. Even those who wear street clothes to shows might opt to add an element of festive attire before heading to a concert. Others are gifted flair mid-show from people they have never met. Fans bestow strangers with gifts of decorated Uno cards, homemade stickers, and pins as they pass joints and vape pens. Concert goers show, share glow sticks and bags of white powder with friends old and new in an environment where excess is the dominant mode of being. The visual impact of the crowds and their embellished outfits is enhanced by the smells of a fish show. Cannabis smoke fills the air and commingles with the scent of sweaty, gyrated fans, many of whom wear patchouli oil or natural deodorant, if any at all. The prevalence of mind-altering substance is in and of itself jarring. Drug and alcohol use are rampant at fish shows, as many fans indulge to enhance their musical and bodily experience. People move in uninhibited ways, twirling and bopping in freeform step. For such fans, drugs encourage such release. Others need no chemical encouragement to shed the expectations of general society and join the fish experience. And we should also note that this is not, um, is not confined to the show venue itself, but it also extends into the parking lot where, how should we describe it? It's like a, a 
special version of tailgating. Yeah, there you go. That's just to paint the picture a little bit of what this looks like. This book asks a simple question. What is the connection between fish and Jewish identity? Perhaps unsurprisingly, especially to those of you in the Jews, Judaism, and Jewish Identities class who are here tonight, the answer is not so simple. As a complex mosaic of religious and cultural ties link the band's music with Jewishness. As evidenced by the chapters in this book, fish shows are alternate sites of Jewish cultural production and religious connection. So too, fish is one of many avenues through which Jews find Jewish cultural and spiritual fulfillment outside the confines of traditional and institutional Jewish life. Put simply, in and through fish, a multitude of Jews are creating innovative Jewish rituals, building Jewish community, and engaging with and producing Jewish culture. Fish fandom and the live fish experience act as a microcosm through which we see American Jewish religious and cultural life manifest in unique and in disparate ways. For much of the 20th century, American Jewish life centered around institutions, including synagogues, federations, and community centers. In recent decades, these mainstays of Jewish institutional life have become less attractive, in particular to younger Jews. Today, fewer American Jews identify as religious than in decades past, and fewer American Jews belong to synagogues. American Jews are increasingly choosing alternative Jewish spaces and seeking new and meaningful points of Jewish connection or eschewing Jewish connection altogether. As a result, innovative and adaptive American Jews have created new models and organizations for engaging Jewishly. The past two decades have seen a proliferation of niche organizations offering opportunities to participate in Jewish life. Contemporary Jews have the freedom to choose from a wide tent of Jewish activities, institutions, and approaches, all of which offer Jewish cultural and or religious connection. Even beyond these groups, American Jews craft Jewish experience in independent ways, carving out their own unique forms of Jewish expression. Younger Jews in particular are increasingly seeking out exciting and hip ways of being Jewish. Many want to connect to a Jewish past, to Jewish community, and even to Judaism and religious belief in ways that feel fitting and culturally relevant within their contemporary lives. They may embrace pickling, or perhaps they bake artisanal challah and post pictures on Instagram. They may be active in Jewish a cappella groups. They might meet weekly with their Jewish improv troupe or monthly with their women's circle. Or maybe they gather with Jewish friends whenever they have the chance to see their favorite band. Though at first glance, some of these activities might seem devoid of Jewish significance, for those engrossed in them, they represent methods of engaging and performing Jewish identities in deep and meaningful ways. Attending fish concerts is one such method. As the relationship between fish and Jews exemplify, younger generations of American Jews are connecting Jewishly in unexpected ways and in unexpected places, a reality that shapes the ways in which Jewish fans listen to and participate in the fish experience. Each chapter in this book reveals Jewishness in and around fish. Readers will encounter celebration of the band's rendition of Jewish songs by Jewish fans, as well as Jewish and fish-inspired merchandise available for purchase both outside concert venues and online. From concert goers <laughs> gathering for prayer during set breaks to participating Jewish fan groups on social media, Jewish fans are engaging in distinctly Jewish behavior as they celebrate their favorite band. The contributions to this volume individually and collectively explore fish as a site for cultural connection and religiosity. Together, they beg you to consider what Jewishness looks like, what constitutes religion, and how transformed we can be by rock and roll. We want to point to some of the things. Hold on, how do we continue? Oh, saw that. All right, so we want to talk about a bunch of the ways that Jewishness, yeah, you can do that. We want to point to a bunch of the ways that Jewishness shows up in fish, and we can all talk about this. So um, in 1994, on New Year's Eve, at the Boston Garden, fish 
rode in to the venue on a giant hot dog. This is the hot dog. It is now in the, hanging in the atrium of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio. What most people don't know is that one of the two members, one of the two Jewish, one of the two members of the band who grew up in Jewish households, Mike Gordon, the bass player, asked a rabbi to come and bless the hot dog to make it kosher. So, so um, this is the kosher hot dog that has become very famous and a big part of Jewish lore. Two of the members of the band come from Jewish households, the drummer, John Fishman, after whom the band is named, and Mike Gordon, the bass player. This is a picture of John Fishman in Israel on top of Masada, where he traveled. Um, this is a picture of Trey Anastasio, the lead guitar player, playing a solo acoustic concert at Sixth and I Synagogue in Washington, D.C. <laughs> this is the fish logo. A very creative chef made a potato latke for the Hanukkah holiday in the shape of the fish logo. On your left, you see a picture of set break or after the show? Uh, at the set break, it is. All right, so. We're in the Oh, great. This is a picture of Rabbi Shalom Bachner, who is with us tonight. But one of the things that's like, Fish plays a different show every night. So some of us have been watching. Um, videos of Taylor Swift's concert this summer, which has been pretty impressive. She comes out and plays three and a half hours, but it's roughly the same show or similar show every night. Fish plays a three and a half hour show every night, and they play a different song. They, they never repeat the same song like one night to the second night. So they have enough of a repertoire that there's, every set is different, and they play two sets of music usually. So they play two, let's say, 70 to 90 minute sets. On, on New Year's Eve, they play three sets and certain other special concerts. And so what, what some of the language we're using, when we think about like, oh, parking lot is where people will go. Let's say the show starts at, it's, if it says it's going to start at 7.30, that means it starts at 8. That's just like what you know when you're at a fish show. It's sort of like if you've been dra if you're being dragged to a synagogue, some people will say like, oh, it starts at 9, but you don't have to actually get there till 10. Similarly, okay. And then the other thing is that, so set break is a, is a key moment. It's when you go meet up with your friends or for people who want to hit one of the three uh, prayer services that, that traditional Jews will, will say every day, usually the evening service. So then set break is a time for one of those services. So I just want to mention that you're seeing some explicitly Jewish behavior in these images. And we're going to talk about what's happening in a moment. Before we talk about what's happening at set break and then with the other image at a festival, um, it's important to note that much like the hot dog, Jewishness is often covert. And so we're seeing this very active presence of Jewish behavior in these images. And we saw two members of the band doing, uh, doing different things in distinctly Jewish spaces. That's not always the case. And so it's important to just mention that we're starting with very Jewish activity and spaces. And um, we'll get back to that hot dog and kind of how Jewishness can be a part of the fabric of what's happening. So it's set break in between two sets of music. In some venues at some places, groups of Jews gather to pray. This is a particularly special and important moment at a set break minion because uh, Shalom is saying Kaddish, the mourner's prayer, uh, in honor to and memory of his father, who passed away that year. Um, at a fish festival. Yeah, it's like a multi, multi day set of shows where people are hanging out. Sleeping over. Camping out. 
there is a tent known as the Shabbat tent, and they're celebrating Shabbat and reading the Torah. If you notice, one of the people is wearing a kippah that looks just like this. This um, donut pattern image is the unofficial logo of the band because the drummer, John Fishman, wears a muumuu at every single performance with this pattern on it. So talking about identity and how we can represent our identity in covert ways as fish fans, uh, that, you know, and again, that hot dog kind of concept, a fish fan might wear these donuts on a collared shirt. And only people that know will know. There's a concept from the Talmud, Hamevin Yevin, the person who understands, understands. If you know, you know. There are, mark there are numerous markers in the fish fandom that signal to others, I'm also an insider. I'm one of you, and this pattern is one of them. This is a page of Talmud with, well, a piece of art that looks like a page of Talmud with lyrics to a fish song on it. So we are uh, intended to apply a textual, textual exegesis to the song Run Like an Antelope. At set break at Madison Square Garden of a fish show, two Orthodox rabbis are there meeting, hanging out, and this is after a set break minion, a prayer service. I want to point out that the drastic majority of the images you are seeing are of men and of white men. Fish is an overwhelmingly white and male scene. And there are chapters in this book that address both of those things. Well, so I think that, that it's interesting to, that we're starting with the overt images of Judaism, um, or overtly ritual, and, and um, so like in, in there is a sect of Orthodox Jewry called Chabad, and their practice is to get men to put on phylacteries to fill in in lots of different spaces. So if you run into them on the streets of New York City, and they'll be asking random m men to put on to fill in, and so they also sometimes have a tent at um, in the parking lot. So you can get your like bong over here and you can put on tefillin over there. Um, here you have um, two guys who, it's a t-shirt that says fish in Hebrew, um, Pe Yud Shin, and they're also wearing kippot. And then um, you can see uh, um, a number of men wearing fish uh, kippot at a, uh, yarmulkes at a wedding. And I'll say I have a friend who's a rabbi in New York, who was like contacted by fish fans who said, can you come do our wedding? Because we know you're also a fish fan and we want to have like a fish themed wedding. So um, people are, do lots of special fun things in the world. There's a lot of variety and this is one of them. Here's a Hanukkah for the uh, Hanukkah holiday with the fish logo in it. This is a dreidel, a like, top that you spin during the holiday with the face of the lead guitar player, uh, Trey Anastasio. This is known as a treidel. It's, it's worth mentioning, one of the things that's happened in the last 30 years, fish has been around for a long time, right? They're, they started in 1983. Um, as and there's, I think someone writes about this in the book, but there's um, just as, because merchandise has become cheaper to make, like there's a whole sc um, school of scholarship that studies religion and capitalism, um, and it's 
it, it's great material. Are you going to be talking about this? So it's just worth noting, many, the Jewish items are, in, are also a reflection of the fact that in fish fandom, there's like a lot of random stuff that fish fans are buying that has obviously nothing to do with Ju Judaism. What's going on, you're seeing here, is a bunch of different um, ritual items that are created with fish logos and in celebration of fish in the same way that if you are a fish fan that with no Jewish association, you might have fish water bottles and fish headphones and fish hats and fish cutting boards and fish whatever, meaning there's, there's, there's a whole growth of, of merchandise that I think has to do with Chinese manufacturing, global capitalism, and, there, and it's worth thinking about how religion plays into that. So I think that is a perfect note to turn to the, the question, why are these items being produced? There's this proliferation of merchandise available, but why specifically are fans creating the tradal? Why is it so exciting for the owner of this Hanukkah to be able to show it on one of the social media forums that is specifically aimed at Jewish fish fans? So I encountered this, this Hanukkah for the first time on Gefilte Fish, the Facebook group. And yes, it's spelled with a PH. And, and Gefilte Fish is a, I'm not gonna call it a delicacy, it's not my thing, but people love it. It's a, a fish dish that is uh, from the Ashkenazi Jewish tradition. And so the members of this Facebook group decided to play up their Jewish identity by leaning into Jewish food puns, and you'll notice that many t-shirts that are Jewishly inspired on the fish parking lot uh, marketplace will also focus on food, as it's one of those joyful Jewish avenues that people embrace as they identify fully as their Jewish selves. So I would love to take a few moments to turn to you and to hear about some of the factors that might inspire Jewish people to find fish, to seek out fish, and to become fans that are so dedicated that their merchandise is a big part of their religious expression. In doing research for this book, I identified five factors of to why there are so many Jewish fish fans and why they're doing Jewish things at fish. The first has to do with summer camp, Jewish summer camp. In the 1990s, in geographically diverse places, at Jewish summer camps, people started listening to fish and um, have, the research shows that uh, Jewish overnight summer camp is one of the places that helps develop some of the most significant and formative meaningful Jewish experiences in a person's life. It's not a coincidence that people discovered fish in summer camp and that fish also became a significant uh, avenue for fun and meaningful joyous Jew Jewish experiences. In different camps all over the country, a counselor would have the music, learn about it, play it for their campers, and they would pass down the music from generation to generation in a much the same way that Jews pass the Torah down from generation to generation. And I can say that I was one person who first learned fish at Jewish summer camp. Josh is another one. In doing the, the work for this book, it turns out that two of the contributors to this book went to summer camp together, Josh and another person, Jake Cohen. They reconnected in doing this book for the first time in two decades, something like that. So Jewish summer camp is a big part of this. Um, and now, actually, at Jewish summer camps, there, some of the reformed Jewish summer camps across the country, they're, doing, they're singing prayers in Hebrew to the melody of fish songs. 
The second factor is, has to do with the rise of a, the importance of Jewish cultural identity and Jews around the country starting to identify as Jewish culturally, not only as religiously, and really playing up in the 80s and 90s in particular as fish was rising into fame, people uh, really connecting through to their Jewishness through cultural avenues. Synagogues were not interesting or meaningful to a lot of people. They went searching for cultural experiences elsewhere and fish was one of the places where they found it. Third factor is that Jews have a deep affinity for counterculture. In a sense, Jew American Jews are countercultural almost by definition. They are outside of the mainstream. There, are, um, there have been disproportionate representation of Jews in uh, countercultural spaces, certainly relative to the general population of Jews, both in new religious movements, in the countercultural hippie revolution, and other places. Um, Fish is the quintessential countercultural band in the United States today. Despite their attempts to not be popular, they have gotten popular. They don't have a single hit in a they never had a billboard chart song. Yeah, no, none. You'll never hear them on the radio. They don't have songs that are viable for radio play. They're long and they're wacky and they don't make sense for commercial radio play. So they have existed on the fringes of the musical scene, and yet they are consistently one of the highest grossing touring acts in the United States every year that they tour. This relates to the fourth factor, which is socioeconomics, um, where Jews first encountered fish, which was in the Northeast, they were playing, Fish was playing in small liberal arts colleges and in college towns around the Northeast, which had a large population of Jews, certainly, again, uh, proportionate to the general population of the United States. But this is also a place where Jews had socioeconomic, benefited from socioeconomic class status. They had money to go see concerts uh, while they were in college to not have to work and go travel around and see them again and again and again. So the socioeconomic factor relates also to geography. That's significant. And the last one I think is my favorite and maybe one of the most important, and that is humor. I talked about this in class today that uh, American Jews believe that humor is one of the most important things about what it means to them to be Jewish, according to Pew Research uh, polls. Jews like humor. This is a funny band. They like to troll their fans. They do ridiculous things. I mean, their drummer wears a mumu every single concert. He wore one, he picked one out of a bin at Salvation Army, wore it on concert, played it. The next day for a gig, he showed up without it. His bandmate said, where's the moo moo? He's like, I was just wearing one thing. They're like, well, we're not going on stage if you don't wear it. And he's worn it for the next like 35 years at every concert. Um, they like to troll their fans. They have done um, they like to spell things out. They had a tradition of spelling things out in their shows. So one time they spelled out um, the first song, the first letter of every song spelled out, fuck your face. And then they played the song that they have called Fuck Your Face. Um, they played a set with every song beginning with the letter S. They are ridiculous and funny. And Jews have really attached themselves to that. So this is why so many Jews have found this band and find it interesting and a place where they do and have meaningful Jewish experiences. Another factor is that they play Jewish music. Not many top tier touring acts are playing Jewish music to a live audience. And I think that's something that has factored into many Jewish listeners' um, appreciation for and relationship 
with the band. So I'd love to share a personal vignette, if I may, something I don't generally do while giving academic talks, but when we're talking about fish, I cannot separate my experience from this research. Um, so my first fish show, I was 13 years old, and you notice we use the term show instead of concert, and that relates to what Oren read from the book, right? This is more than just a concert. It is, it is a spectacle. It is an experience. And I attended this first concert. I really didn't know much music by the band. I think I had gotten one CD from my cousin, generation to generation. And they played Avinu Malkainu. Avinu Malkainu is a sacred prayer. It is a holy supplication that is most frequently associated with the high holidays of the Jewish year. So we're talking about a prayer that most people associate with Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the high holidays, the days of awe, the days when Jews are supposed to be the most connected with their Jewish community and also with their higher power. And I was absolutely shocked. <laughs> I didn't know how to respond at first. I froze. And then I realized that I was experiencing something that was so wholly different from anything that I, I mean, how many experiences did I have? I was 13. But um, to reflect now, decades later, that experience was still unlike anything that I've, I've experienced elsewhere in my life. And the reason was I was a young seeker. I was trying to find myself as a Jewish person. I was trying to understand where I fit and I was enthralled by counterculture and I was excited by the music scene and I felt so seen. I felt recognized. I felt like I belonged and that's something that is not unique to my experience of hearing Fish play a Jewish song and the reason I wanted to share my personal experience is that it didn't relate to the Jewish identity of a band member or the Jewish upbringing of two band members. Mind you, finding out about their Jewish upbringing was exciting to me when I, I did discover that they had that upbringing. But my experience was very much focused on the space that Fish created for Jewish identity in the venue. The concert venue became a synagogue, and all of this energy that I felt was so affirming, again, as a Jewish person. Now that's, again, something that I heard over and over again as I interviewed people and prepared my contribution to this volume. What is it about playing Jewish music that is so impactful for a Jewish listener? How many popular bands play Swing Low Sweet Chariot? How many times have you heard someone on TV sing Amazing Grace as a part of their concert? Probably frequently, I would imagine. And even if you haven't, because that has not been your experience, a quick Google search of popular acts playing these distinctly religious songs proves that this is not an infrequent element of the American pop culture arena. And yet, when we look for music that comes from other religious traditions, it is infrequent that we find a band of Fish's stature incorporating Jewish songs. So do you want to?
Fans are talking about this after they leave concert venues. They're writing about catching Fish's rendition of, of Inu Malkainu live. They're sharing on social media. They are seeking out opportunities to catch this song. And quite frankly, they're quite impressed that I caught it at my first Fish show. <laughs> but this is a significant moment for Fish fans who are Jewish and who may find during iterations of Avinu Malkainu that they are feeling connected to Jewish community and also to the divine. This is not an, an experience that's limited to iterations of Avinu Malkainu. Jewish fish fans and all fish fans are feeling connected to community at fish concerts. They're feeling inspired to live their most authentic lives at fish concerts. And they are connecting with divinity in a multitude of ways. And yet there is something distinct about the way that Jewish listeners connect at fish concerts, around fish concerts, in parking lots, outside of concert venues, on social media. And what we're finding is that this connection that Fish provides to a specific kind of Jewish community is so incredibly affirming and so core for so many. Not every Jewish Fish fan is posting on the Gefilte Fish Facebook group or elsewhere on the many um, social media forums dedicated to fish culture. Many just may feel that moment of connection while catching a Vinu Malkainu or that moment of connection while seeing a friend from camp. But others are inspired to connect with the divine, to connect with God during those moments and they are inspired to bring that energy with them into the rest of their lives. Great, so thank you. So um, my research was specifically about how, why is it that certain, what I'm gonna call self-identified religious Jews draw upon their fish experience into what we might call their normative religious identity. And, I, and underlying some of this conversation, we haven't, I don't know if we've said it explicitly, is we have to take into consideration that Judaism is an ethnic religion. And what I mean by that is that it has this, con it has this conflict inside its uh, definition. On one hand, one inherits a Jewish identity by either being born into that identity or converting in. It is an, ex it, it has some notion of, um, I'm, I'm a Jew just by being. And if you're a Jew just by being, it means you don't have to participate in a set of religious practices and you can go do all of the set of cultural uh, uh, practices that you identified and you can't get kicked out. And I'll say, I teach a, a Masters of Divinity students at, gra at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley and most of my Christian students are floored by that idea. They're floored by the fact that you don't have to believe in God to be a Jew. That in fact it comes with this sort of what I call an imagined biology because if I do 23andMe and my Moroccan Jewish friends and my Syrian Jewish friends and my Indian, like Cochin Jewish friends, that we don't have the same DNA but we have this shared sense of being a Jew. And then there's this whole other thing which is the set of aspirations, religious aspirations, moral aspirations, set of quality, ritual activities that one has to do. And I was struck by the fact that Jews, meaning self-identified Jews, who are self-identified religiously also, are drawing upon their fish experience. And the paradigmatic vision of that for me, the paradigmatic uh, person, character, is the musical artist Madis Yahu, who was this weird character that came out in the early, mid-2000s. He was dressed in Hasidic garb, Jewish uh, black hat, black jacket, black pants, white shirt, playing reggae. And he did not grow up a religious Jew. He grew up a suburban, reformed Jewish kid, or observant Jew, I should say. Reconstructionist in my synagogue. Oh, sorry, Reconstructionist. Um, <laughs> which is a liberal movement uh, uh, 
a liberal in a liberal movement in the Jewish community, and he spoke about by virtue of going to fish shows, he became an, a, a Jew who was observant of Jewish law, of halakha. I want to understand that because, guess what? I grew up as an active reform Jew, and I migrated in my Jewish identity to be someone who's much more, finds much, com himself comfortable in, I would say, more traditional settings. And much of that had to do with my social network was involved with fish. I went to camp. I saw my first fish show with my camp. Like, last year of camp, I don't know, this is in the 90s, so parents didn't know anything and there was no social media. My, I moved when I was 14 from Massachusetts to Colorado. The first week of school, I was wearing a fish t-shirt. Some other Jewish kid wearing a fish shirt named Josh, because he was also a Jewish boy from born in 1980. Also, oh, we should be friends. When I moved to Israel at age 21 to study in yeshiva, my person who would become my best friend was wearing a fish shirt, also, like me, on the first night that we showed up at yeshiva. So it's part of my social network, but it's also part of, there's a certain religious experience that I'm having that I'm not having in synagogue. I want to think about what is that, what Durkheim calls collective consciousness, that when you're part of the production scene like this, you're feeling something with other people. I want to understand that. So. I created, I did some research around what I call, there's, a, there's an article by a woman named Leora Lawton, of course, she's also a demographer who used to live in Berkeley and go to my synagogue, called Jewish Deadheads, about Grateful Dead, Jewish fans of Grateful Dead. But she wasn't interested in the religious experience, she's just interested in the like, why are there so many Jews at Grateful Dead shows? And I wanted to flip it on its head. I was interested in fish Jews, in, self-identified religious Jews who, who um, have some experience of fish. I'll say one more thing about why this felt really important. In the Jewish world, in post-Holocaust American Judaism, is not that interested in what's called lived religion, right? It's not that interested. There's not a lot of study of how Jews do Judaism. They're much more interested in a sociological concern of are Jews staying Jewish? I was interested in a lived religion question. Lived religion, by the way, coined by a really important Catholic scholar, Bob Orsi, who says, um, Robert Orsi's at, at, I think he's at Northwestern now, he was at Harvard. Um, he says, what is religion? Religion is what people do together with the divine. It's a great definition, what people do together with the divine. And so I wanted to study how they do that at Fish. So I, I created a survey and I asked, all these people, and there was all these different ways of creating the survey so that it, it could isolate those who were self-identified as religious, and I, I made it broad. You didn't have to be orthodox or conservative or reform. You just had to identify and articulate, and then I started asking questions about their role of, of, of fish and their spirituality, um, and they said some really interesting things. One thing they said, can I have the book by the way? One thing they said is, oh, Fish is all about improvisation. So the song you're seeing, when we heard songs, they might play two minutes of something they've practiced and then 15 minutes of just wild stuff. And they've spent hours and hours and hours of playing together so that they could get there. And all of a sudden, all of these, all of these people, I should say, 40 rabbis responded to my survey. That's a lot of rabbis in America. Like, there aren't that many rabbis, um, right? If there are 1,500 rabbis in America, to have 40 who have, who have uh, happened upon a survey that was um, sort of used social networks to get out there, and they're saying things about their, their religious experience. So one of the things is they say, oh, there's a ritual foundation to improvisation. Improvisation is about doing something over and over again and then playing with it. And in fact, that's a really great definition of what it means to be involved in a ritual. If you are someone who prays three times a day, that can, get, that can start to feel monotonous. But actually, when you're doing it over and over again, you start to learn how to improvise over it. And that's one thing they said. The second thing they said is, um, in the jam, right, Fish is playing a jam, and in that jam, you get to wonder and wander, 
right? Like it's a time when you're both inside this ritual experience and when you're inside a ritual experience, you actually think about your life a little bit because the point of doing ritual, this is Adam Seligman who's a great scholar of religion and anthropology at BU. He says, oh, ritual is the opposite of sincerity. Ritual is doing things over and over again and what makes it right is that you're doing it over and over again. Sincerity is trying to make something correct all the time. Sincerity, he says, leads to fundamentalism, which is a great observation that fundamentalism is born out of having everything need to be meaningful every time. Ritual is actually, it's only meaningful by doing it over and over again. So they're saying, oh, so this one person is describing, this is a rabbi, describing this particular performance of a song called Tweezer, which is oftentimes has an extended like 40 minute long song. It occurred to me that the conscious thinking minds of everybody in this room, sorry, this is actually Trey Anastasio, the, the, leads, the, lead, the lead singer, um, as individuals had momentarily vanished and whoever was in line for the bathroom or getting a beer was equally affecting the vibration of the jam. So this is Trey, talking about his own experience. And then Yael, a conservative Jew in her 30s explained, a long jam can fill my heart the same way a powerful nigun, a traditional melody without words can, right? That feeling like your heart will overflow from love and connection to the past and the future. Many fish shows have given me that same feeling. So you're getting, think about what is, what is, a good example of what people do together with the divine is transcendence, right? It's about thinking about what did my grandparents do? What did my ancestors do? And that's that same feeling of connection. So connection is just not just us in the room. Connection is what we draw into that room when we're having this experience of collective consciousness. I just wanna offer one more um, example, which is I was really struck, one of my um, respondents is an ultra-Orthodox Jew now. He did not grow up ultra-Orthodox, right? So he lives a very, um, how would we say it, um, contained lifestyle, right? He wears a certain uniform. He is in a very closed off community. And he says the following. I hope I can find where I put it. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, so I'll, I'll tell you the story. I thought I could find what he said, but I can't. Um, he says, I, ah, the same way, this is what he says, I became observant because the same way the music is so tight and so well coordinated, I want to find that balance and harmony in my life of observance, study, avodah, worship, Shmiras habris, channeling male sexuality, meaning only thinking about like when sexuality in very small uh, doses. And of course, simcha joy and dveikus, ch uh, clinging to God. And this guy, Yechezkel, for him, fish music pr represents like an aspirational balance between order and play. And I was just struck by the fact that this guy is living in a very, very, orthodox environment and he's drawing from his experience in fish to get there. And later he makes a connection. He says, I now judge all of my religious experiences through the lens of fish. So he is part of a, there's a tradition in orthodox, in ultra-orthodox spaces to go to Uman, which is a town in, um, in Ukraine to go to the grave of Rebbe Nachman of Bratslav and to commune and to sing. And he says, I judge my experience in Uman based on if it lives up to the fish show, which is a crazy experience. The last thing I'll say, so many rabbis across denominations said, I, I want my congregation to feel like a fish show, which is profound. I think a lot of us, I certainly grew up in a congregation where it felt staid, suburban, staid Judaism. And Fish presents an alternative vision. So we've got rabbis, first of all, this came out in September. 
Rabbi literally the next, like the next week, sent me an email saying, I just changed my entire sermon for Rosh Hashanah, for the Jewish New Year, one of the most important nights in, the, in Jewish tradition, based on this book, to talk about my own fish experience to my community. There are, as, um, as, uh, as Oren said, they're using f tunes, but I think there's both the drawing it into the regular day-to-day, -day, but the fact that it becomes the paradigm for a worship experience is just profound to me. I think it speaks to um, what it means to exist as an American Jew in the 21st century. I should say there were respondents who were Canadian, there were respondents who were Israeli, there were, so there, it shows up in a, in a bunch of locations, but I think it's a particularly f uh, American phenomenon. Um, so that's what I, I would say. It, it was really fascinating to me. It's obviously something that still excites me and I, I like to talk about. <laughs> so you've really highlighted for us that fish can be a site of religious, connection, it can be a site of religious practice, and it can infuse its, its energy into religious congregations. And that's something that I think I just want to spend one moment talking about from a, a little bit of a different angle. And that is, um, that is an angle that kind of, I think, eliminates too often the potential for religion to coexist with popular culture. Um, generally, when we look to the body of scholarship that reflects on popular culture and popular music. There's this basic understanding that seems to kind of pervade the body of scholarship that rock and roll or music can basically become religion. And I'll quote Ozzy Osbourne who famously said, rock and roll is my religion. And that's something that I actually heard over and over again while attending Fish concerts doing research for the volume. I also heard people talk about how profoundly dedicated they were to their Jewish identity, both in a cultural and religious sense. So we're seeing in and around Fish that Jewish identity can be enhanced, can be modified, can be expanded through the phenomenon that is fish. We're just scratching the surface here. There's obviously so much more, like a whole book's worth and more, but we wanna stop here and uh, open it up for conversation, respond to questions. So, uh, yeah, I'm gonna give you a microphone. Yep, <laughs> for the recording now. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of dying to ask this question, and it starts a little bit from what you said, Ariella, about your own sort of infatuation with subculture at 13, that plus, We've, we've missed a little bit in terms of where this comes historically. Yes. So that's and um, I think that I'd love to hear what you have to say about that because I think it's because of where American Judaism was that this was able to come about. So. So I think, um, oh my, this one seems to be louder than the other. Um, so I think for me, I was not aware of American Judaism and its ebbs and flows and cultural developments um, as a 13 year old, but I certainly was a product of the staid kind of suburban Jewish experience that um, Josh mentioned. However, I went to a very unique synagogue at a certain point, we switched synagogues, Matis Yahoo Synagogue, and clearly the rabbi there was creating space <laughs> for inquiry on what Jewishness could look like. So my experience, I think, is a bit unique in that I very much did participate in the type of Hebrew school experience that many of my, um, my colleagues did as well, but I also had a connection with a Jewish leader who created space for 
that countercultural uh, passion that grew inside of me uh, within Jewish practice. But I think the recognition of where American Jewish life had kind of taken itself a place that was, in, a, 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 in the opinion of many people, very dry and devoid of emotional connection, it's, it's a reality that has kind of led to the development of these communities of Jewish expression that are so authentic to where we are in our lives today. And those places are um, carved out by individuals who seek out spaces that feel affirming to them. And that's a process that has taken place over decades, but over the last, I would say, 15 years or so, we've seen these efforts of individuals to create spaces that really are applicable and energizing. And they've, we've seen them become organizations that function in a very different way than when we're looking at a collection of individuals. So as these organizations pop up and grow into uh, decade-long endeavors, we see a shift away from that Jewish experience that left so many wanting to a place of joy. Uh, I'll just offer my, um, my work, my academic work is on how material culture mediates our thinking. So I, I'm, I wrote about how, uh, I wrote a doctorate on how um, digital tools impact Jewish knowledge construction. And the reason why I'm sharing that is to say, Fish arrives at a time when you don't have CDs. You don't have Spotify, you don't have any of these digital tools. You had to trade tapes Fish also, right, like, um, uh, everyone know what a tape is? Yes. Okay. So someone would come at camp, with a, someone who was at a college would, Fish allowed their um, uh, concert goers to tape the shows. So then you would have a bootleg of the show and you would pass the tape around. So if you have a strong social network because Jews have a t are tied in a way that are, is actually cross, Jews are tied across um, geographic space in ways that is different than the, the, uh, the dominant culture community. And they're encountering fish because they have older brothers or older sisters or counselors who are at camp. So you have that social network this, that is tied to this digital tool, which is this tapes that people are trading. And the second thing is, is that Fish is one of the first bands that has a fan um, website that allow, that's wiki-based, that allows people to talk to one another and counter one another. So there's this rich social network with digital tools that then allows people to draw upon that and hit the... Anthropo like I think this, the Jewish settings that you're talking about, Anne, and that, that Ariel is talking about, which is a desire for a different type of Jewish setting. And for me, those three things combined really allows it to become this sort of the machine that it becomes. Thank you so much. Um, I'm fascinated with what you've presented. Um, you did mention at one point that you would come back to talking about male and white, and I hope that you will. Uh, but my question is actually, are there other subcultures that feel similarly connected to fish that have nothing to do with Judaism, but they feel a connection to other fish fans because they share a subculture? Absolutely, and I think um, this is kind of, I'll start by talking about Mike Side, Dyke Side so that we can right away deal with both questions. <laughs> um, Mike Side, Dyke Side is an organization that is dedicated to supporting all members of the fish community and it is an LGBTQIA space that really has become a network for a lot of fish fans. And that's just one of the specific groups um, that I'll mention. I can also uh, mention fans for uh, free 
fans for racial and economic uh, equity, sorry. I was throwing an economic in there because there are two E's, but that is not correct. Um, so free works to, again, ensure inclusion and eradicate racism and other forms of bias from the fish community. And so those are two examples of groups of fish fans that are coming together to prioritize their values and celebrate the community that is fish and their specific community within fish. Um, Fish is a white space. It is a male-dominated space, as most most of the kind of um, jam and experimental music scenes are. I'm thinking about the progressive mu music scene and the jazz scene, um, male-dominated um, in general. And then when we look at the racial makeup of a Fish concert, uh, you know, it very much aligns with what we see in larger kind of metal scenes as well. And so the, the gendered and racial uh, makeup of a Fish concert does mirror other sorts of rock and roll shows, but certainly we're seeing other touring musicians who have inverted that dynamic. And I just think it's important to mention that while Fish is very unique and its fan community is extremely special and dedicated, um, we have to just mention Taylor Swift and what she has done in terms of bringing together a very different group of concert goers. And their purpose is the same, togetherness, joy, and I think that's something that um, resonates with her fans, albeit in a slightly uh, more anesthetized setting than, <laughs> <laughs> than the Fish concert. There is a, there, there's an interesting book called, this doesn't, this is adjacent to your question, there's an interesting book called You Don't Know Me But You Hate Me, which is a, which is a um, studies fish and the insane clown posse. And it says that they're very similar scenes if you're trying to understand the the like sort of how weird we're talking um and i think one of the the question of are there other subgroups is a great question that i don't know like yeah so like i don't know because one of the things is like it also reflects a feature of judaism which is there's like a lot of stuff in judaism like there's there's all the there's all the ritual items that you can then turn into a fish thing. So if you have a lot of stuff, you can then put upon it the fish stuff. I didn't answer that part of the question and I appreciate you reminding me. Um, so in my research, I actually did quite a bit of, um, of research to try to deduce whether there were other religious groups or other identity groups that were claiming the fish space and crafting the kinds of conversations around the fish phenomenon out of, uh, out of the concert setting and online. And you really don't find the kind of dialogue that we're seeing when it comes to fish and Judaism and Jewish identity. In fact, there are few mentions of Christian Jewish fan communities that you find, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, thank you. Uh, Christian fish fan communities that you find around um, fish culture online. Um, but generally, they relate to questions of um, retaining morality in and around fish. Mm -hmm. So there will be someone posting online, I'm searching for my Christian community to give me guidance. I really like the band Fish, but I feel tempted when I'm there. How can I maintain my Christian identity and my devotion to God while in attendance? You don't hear that in these Jewish fish circles. Instead, what you find is, wow, I really saw God last night. <laughs> The, the book as a project, not to, like, Oren and myself, there, there's a woman, um, Stephanie Jenkins, who's a professor at uh, uh, Oregon State, and she created the first academic studies conference of fish uh, in, two, in two, 2019. So Oren and myself and two others presented. Um, we were the only, like, subgroup that presented at the conference. There was, a, there was some great... It's all online, and there's some great stuff on racial justice and and race, and um, but there was not a lot of other thing subgroups. Yeah. Can you imagine 
in a world in which every fish fan gets a copy of this book? Are, are, you, are you offering to fund something? <laughs> We we wrote this book very much. We we did this whole project very much with two groups in mind. One is well, three groups really. One is Jewish fish fans, and there are many. The second is Jews who don't like fish or don't know fish, but have a person in their life where fish is everything, like many of us in this room and many of the contributors to this book to help uh, render the fish experience intelligible to them because it is utterly ridiculous, truly, to, I mean, my family knows, they ask, I tell them, oh, I'm gonna be in Colorado this weekend. Oh, what are you doing there? And I'm like, really, do you have to ask that question? It's been 27 years, you're still asking me, what am I doing? I'm going to see fish, oh, right again, fish, like to render that all intelligible to them. And then the third group is um, fish fans who are not Jewish, who see their favorite band play Avinu Malkeinu, and it's like, what is that? Why are there so many Jews here? Why are people wearing shirts in Hebrew? Can someone explain that? Oh yeah, I have noticed that. So, yeah, we can imagine a world in which every fish fan has a copy of this book, but actually, moreover, that they'll actually read the book, um, which I should say is an important creed in the fish community, this idea of read the book. Um, I won't explain it right now. If you know, you know. Yeah, if you know, you know. I'm a vin, just read the book. Um, but I, I, I think that this book really does explain why there are so many Jews, but moreover, I think for our purposes tonight, what's important is understanding how people find meaningful Jewish experiences and make meaningful Jewish lives in and through this rock and roll band. And that's unique. And that, look, how, Understanding how people perform their Jewish identities at a rock and roll concert is something we want people to take seriously. That this is, this is legitimate and serious, a scholarship, but also a legitimate um, scholarly inquiry to understand how this is serious, meaningful Jewish things. Okay, so how many shows have you attended? What is your show count? That is a frequent question asked at Fish Concerts to deduce how much of an insider you are, perhaps, or what, or how much knowledge you have about the, the set lists, or, you know, play it on a specific date. I've been to a lot, and I can't remember a single set list. Um, but I actually kind of lost count. Um, I, I think I just gave up after I got to 200. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, this is where, like, I often say, like, all of my friends think I'm, like, a huge fish fan, and then I get with, I'm, like, with fish fans, I'm, like, yeah, I've seen probably 40 or 50 shows, so I'm, like, a faker, <laughs> like, I'm not real, um, and I'll, I'll just say, like, one of the things that, to, to underscore Oren's point, I think that what I started off trying to understand, and I heard Ariella say this, like, I want to understand my own experience, and I want to see that that experience was part of something larger, what I realized is this is actually a really important study of how Judaism happens now, which is to say, oh, there's lots of ways. Ju like, there was a book about um, knitting groups that came out last year and in Jewish congregations. Like, there's lots of things we do. We think of religion as having boundaries. And maybe religion doesn't have so many clear boundaries. And it sort of wafts into different parts of our lives. And the other part of this was, it's now making me reinterpret religion. Like where it used to be about fish, it's actually now going to a fish show is like, oh, now I might be able to understand in the Torah when they're talking about massive festivals, 
oh, like maybe this is my only way to access that. Because I can't access that with 100 people in a synagogue. But being outside with 30,000 people and there's bright lights and there's music, like that sounds like going to the temple in Jerusalem and there's sacrifices and there's fire and there's so many people. Like, oh, I can only counter experience that. So trying to like make sense of religion, like it's like almost the reverse, I guess. I'm not letting Professor Cole Zeldin get out of here without saying his show count. <laughs> I haven't seen fish before. <laughs> um, I've also, I also don't know exactly. I, I think I've seen about 90 maybe shows. Um, but I should say... West Coast, West Coast. West Coast. East Coast. <laughs> Yeah, geography makes a difference. <laughs> Definitely. It, that, there's actually, yeah, there's much to say about the, the show count question, but. My count is 160, but that wasn't my comment, and I could be off by a little bit. I just wanted to, first of all, thank you. It's, it's wonderful to hear your academic um, approach to this. I think the only thing that comes closer to answer your question, in my mind, is the fellowship. The people who go to shows in a um, uh, wishing a drug and alcohol-free lifestyle use the set break um, for the equivalent of AA and Narcotics Anonymous meetings, which is extremely ritual and kind of a, a spiritual subgroup within FISH. And obviously there's some crossover between Jewish fans of FISH and members of the fellowship. But I just wanted to throw that into the mix. It's the only thing I can think of, you said like, you know, Wiccans, but the, they don't seem as organized. Whereas at every, at every, at every FISH concert, there is a place for people to experience it drug and alcohol free. And I don't think it's possible to be at a FISH concert and be the only Jewish person there. I, 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 in my many years of seeing fish, I know I'm not, never the only one. Anyway, thank you so much. I saw some hands over here earlier. Do you still have questions? This is the first time I ever got to use this. Okay, within your research, or you know, while you're researching, did you ever think or understand what could happen when fish is not around? So, like, when they stop, you know, playing, and you don't have these concerts anymore, <laughs> is there for for the Jewish population, for the people who use this as a medium, have you ever thought of the absence of it and potentially another band that would take up the mantle or? Is this something that once they are done or gone or stop playing, they're gone forever? Yeah. How could you ask such a question, Ian? It's a great question. It's a great question. Um, I think there's a time when all of us have wrestled with our own mortality, but also the mortality of our beloved um, band members, idols, people we follow. Um, it's an unpleasant thought. I will say we've talked so much about how Fish is this meaning place for meaningful Jewish and joyful Jewish experiences. It's not only that. I... I, I think many of us experience what we experience at fish only at fish, and it is almost impossible to replicate that elsewhere. Um, there are other bands coming up that people say, oh, yeah, they're the next fish, but there's really only one fish, and there will be other bands that have similar fan bases, but um, I don't see anything else replacing 
fish. I don't want to think about the day when I no longer can see them. I will say that at the last note of an encore, at the end of a run, if I'll see like two, three, four shows, I always take a pause and am in inordinately grateful for the opportunity to have experienced this for so many years, knowing that I might never have this opportunity again. So I have to mention this, uh, because we are in the land of Jerry, right? We are in the land of the Grateful Dead here, and I have to mention this paper that I just uh, completed all about the 50th anniversary shows that just honor the Grateful Dead. And though they featured members of the Grateful Dead, it was an iteration of what once was. And I've always wondered about whether something similar would happen down the line for Fish, whether there would be different attempts at recapturing that which is. But I try not to spend too much time on that because I'm focused on carving out those moments of, of bliss and, and joyful connection at the next concert. So I'll just say, um, the 20th century Jewish philosopher Abraham Joshua Heschel writes a lot about music and, pract and religious practice, but he also has this idea that when you encounter the divine, like on a mountain, right, like you know those moments when you're, it, it, when you encounter the divine in a transcendent experience, what ritual is designed to do is to then go back and try to capture that experience. So that's what going to the synagogue and following ritual is, a, is an attempt to capture that original moment of revelation. And one of the things that I've been thinking about Fish recently, and this is probably true with any of those experiences you've had with masterful with mastery, like you're, you're just witnessing mastery, but you're not witnessing it. It's not that you're a part of it, right? That's what Trey is saying when he's saying, oh, you're part of this connective, you're part of the connective experience and the audience, the, the people in the show are giving him the strength to play the notes in a particular way and there's a, a communal experience. And so you're participating in this experience of revelation. And ex participating in the experience of revelation can't last forever. You have to go out and go do other stuff later. But that's the metaphor that I've been thinking about a lot. And and it's not, so for me, like uh, now, I'm like, I'm not a Taylor fan, but I want to go see the show because people are talking about the show in this, like you're really seeing something masterful. And there are other bands and other musicians that you can go do that with. But I think it's the the ongoing opportunity to be at the Oracle's uh, at the Oracle, and then like eventually the Oracle isn't there anymore. And that's sort of what it feels like. I'm at, in a moment of revelation, and eventually sort of the revelation ends and there's something else. And other subgroups will organize around other musicians and other experience of revelation, but at some point it just ends. And that's, I think, what makes it powerful and, and eternal is that it's eternal, but it's not eternal. Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it. We have books if you want, and we'll be here. See you later. <laughs>